So uh, we'll start with our admin and public works meeting for today, March 14th. And first the item uh, is the roll call. Chair Garitano. Here. Councilmember Bertolino. Here. Councilmember Clark. Here. Councilmember Edens. Here. Councilmember Farmer. Here. Councilmember Hopper. Councilmember Jaxie. Same. Uh, Councilmember Jaxie for a uh, roll call. If you could just turn on your camera and state your presence. We're going for right now. Councilmember Nyhan. Here. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and welcome to our meeting for tonight. I do want to acknowledge also we have Council Member McCutcheon from the Fifth Board and um, our Director of Public Works and City Attorney here and Economic Communications Manager, Tom Lee, and of course, Carla here. So uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is the approval of the minutes for the February 7th meeting. Can I get a motion for approval of those minutes made by Council Member Farmer? Is there a second by Council Member Clark? And any questions or comments on the minutes? All right, then all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Abstain. We have one abstention. All right, the minutes are approved. So now we'll move into the next part of the agenda, which is public participation. I do see we have two attendees uh, on Zoom. If you wish to speak during public participation, this is the time now, if you can use a raise hand feature on Zoom, we'll be able to put you on the screen. All right, then uh, seeing none here in the room or online, we'll move forward then to the next part of our agenda. So administration under for information, Council Member Clark, do you have any updates on number one, which is the update on accessibility? I do not, but I would defer to, um to Mr. Brown, if he has something that he's working on. Um, I, I don't have any information <clears throat> to share. Thank you. Um, if you'd like me to, to reference, I know we uh, identified a potential accessibility map of town center. Um, we have not moved forward with that at this point in time. Um, I had had some prior discussions with Steve Cross and the Department of Planning on that work and um based on the way we envision that moving forward it would be a, a requirement to pull in some consultant help potentially to complete that task and that's in large part why we haven't moved forward just yet with with that work um because it, it does require some expertise and quite frankly some labor that we just don't have free right now to get that done so we haven't moved forward with it with that project just yet um, at this time, but I'd be available for any questions. Any questions for Rick? All right, then we'll move on then to the next part of the agenda there. So we'll move into for action. And I think if there's no objection, we'll save this item here, the closed portion of it for later in the meeting. But I think the update that we can share here for those that are watching is that we continue to move forward with the administ city administrator search process. So at this point right now, we are, uh, we have interviewed five applicants and uh, we will be having a discussion in closed session pertaining to that item there. So we'll continue to move forward and, uh, you know, we'll see what the outcome is of our next steps here. Next steps would likely be in-person interviews and then at some point, we'll have it narrowed down to a candidate that we can recommend to the mayor and city council. Any questions or comments? All right. But I think we've been sharing updates there for everyone, keeping them informed, soliciting feedback every time, and we'll continue to do that. All right. Next is public information in the council minutes. Is that the city attorney or... 
I can attempt to address it to the best of my ability. Um, this is arose out of a request by a resident through, a, I don't know what you would call it, a company that tries to scrub your data from the internet. Um, a gentleman found that his name, address, phone number was in minutes, some city minutes, uh, and the company had asked to have those removed, which would require us then to basically remove the minutes from the city meeting. So the question that was posed was, should we, it's a practice the city has gotten into, it's not required by law, not every city does it, uh, and should the city initiate a policy not to include personal details or personal information in the minutes that are ultimately posted online? Okay, so, and, and what to do with the information that is currently posted. So you're talking about like speakers at Correct. meetings Correct. or any kind of material that's included in the minutes or meeting agendas. It as could well. be someone's uh, an email that someone sent that has all their personal information on it or a uh, information that's in the minutes that uh, identifies them by name, phone number and address. So you, you had an individual that asked to have it removed through a company. Yes. Through a company, okay. So what's the question for the council then? Is it a recommendation on policy on how they should approach those okay. things? All right. And since you're a city attorney, do you have any uh, thoughts on how we would pursue that? I just want to see if you have anything to put on the table as far as well. In terms of the public comment aspect, I don't think any of that needs to be in the minutes, and I wouldn't have any issue legally, and think it would be appropriate. Uh, not provide people's personal contact information in, in minutes. Uh, in terms of emails and communications, they're public records. Uh, they're always accessible from someone who makes a records request, but the question then becomes, do you post it on the city website? Now there's good and bad about that because we do share people's opposition or support of certain activities. And if they include their personal information on it, uh, it'll be posted unless we decide to redact what uh, is posted on the city's website, which means more city man hours to redact that information before it's posted. Okay. All right, I did see Councilmember Orlino and then Edens. Yeah, uh, John, my first thought is that transparency has got to work both ways. If someone is coming before the council with some issue or sends us an email on some issue, um, they are, in my opinion, they are uh, basically trying to be transparent. And we we are not responsible for hiding that that information from the public. That's my personal opinion, anyway. Now, in terms of um, should we be publishing if it wasn't provided for us by that by that individual citizen? If if we were to um, put in minutes, addresses, and phone numbers and emails on our own, obviously we we wouldn't want to do that. But if they provide it via an email or whatever, I think we have every right to put it in the minutes. Yeah, in terms of in terms of the minutes, I, and I could be wrong on this, and that may be a question to Megan, but I believe what's happening is they're submitting their speaker card, and she's just filling in the information from the speaker's card. Uh, and the I think the answer is you can say the name this person spoke and leave it at that, not put their address and all that other information, because it's not necessary for the minutes. I mean, frankly, adding the name of the person who spoke isn't necessary for the minutes. But it's been a practice of the cities. I have Council Member Edens and then Clark. I would support redacting a phone number and contact email if there would be one, uh, with the exception that let's say it's an it's a nominating form, like we get an application for a committee and it's a citizen. It would still be helpful for us to have that contact information. Sometimes we do have to contact someone before we vote on the, vote on them. But I think that's helpful for elected officials to have. I see no reason why the general public would need that. The way I see it is your address is very accessible. Um, you hope your cell phone is not, even though it is today. So um, I would also be fine if the minutes just said, you know, the name of the ward someone was from or another city and their name. And, and there's certainly lots of people with the same name, right? How, you know, lots of Joneses, Smiths, you know. So some form of differentiation, I think, is helpful in the minutes. But to what degree? All right, Councilmember Clark. Well, we we have it on video. So it's on, they could watch the video and there's the information. 
you know, they have to state their name and their address. So I don't see the problem in putting it in the minutes myself. And we have on complaint forms as well, we have, we ask them to say, you know, who they are and we put those in our agenda, uh, attached to our agenda sometimes, I think. Yeah, yeah, they're attached to our agenda when someone sends in a complaint about a certain issue or makes a comment that they want to be addressed and names are in that. So what's the difference? I would say, and I know this isn't universally done, but in terms of public comment, there was a policy or practice adopted a couple of years ago where folks did not have to give their address, just their ward. Uh, some people still give their address. And again, I don't disagree with you. And all the information is available for those who want to get it. The question that was posed, and this is just the question posed because of the city clerk being approached about this, is putting it in, putting that information, creating the information, and putting it on the website. Well, um, I think that's fair to make the distinction between an email someone voluntarily sends in and then the minutes of the meeting. I mean, I think, I don't see any other speakers, so I'll comment on it. I mean, I think the minutes are a very valuable tool when you're looking back several years later, like back when there was a topic of discussion and having whatever information is captured there, you know, so-and-so of XYZ Street helps like when you're dealing with a planning and zoning issue, you know, where people near there or where they from a certain distance. Like, I think that just tells the story. I don't know why, you know, maybe is it like on request, but, you know, then is it something we would honor on request, like in that case, or? Well, we have the sign in forms. We can have a checkbox on the sign in form of yes, please include, you know, my information my on the information record. In minutes, or please don't. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole point of the transparency. And you know, you know, if somebody is coming here in a public forum, they should not expect privacy. You know, it's a public forum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think checking a box on the form is fine. That sort of just creates more work for Megan or Carla or whoever's having to do it. I mean, back in my producing days, we would just put a release up on the door that says, if you are entering this space, you know, it is under being recorded. And if you choose to speak, that information is public. I mean, I think letting people know that when they walk in is give them the disclaimer that gives them the option as to whether they want to do it or not. I think like... Councilmember Garitano, I mean, if you walk into a public space, into a public hearing, and you choose to speak, you that information is public. That should, should be how it works. So it's how it works with all of us. So it should go both ways. I'm going to grab a card and see what it asks. I wish we had at least a, a poster up that showed the ward. So when you come in, you you can kind of look at it and know. Um, I, I've, I've said that before because so many people ask me, what ward am I in? And I said, well, I have to look because I don't know the streets in everybody's wards. So the card asks for name, address, zip code, and telephone number. Yeah. I'll make a motion to change the card. Okay. What kind of change then would you recommend? Not to remove telephone number? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, or maybe just put an asterisk so people know that's optional. I mean, I guess maybe people want us to reach out to them, but in general, they don't have to. I think if it's volunt voluntary, like if that means you expect or want us to give you a call, that would be helpful, but if they choose not to give their number, then we have no way to contact them and follow up. I mean, we can put everything, but name is voluntary if we want. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I think, I don't know. I think it's important to know where people live. I mean, that's yeah. an important component of what we're doing because we do have people on occasion that come in not from Wildwood, which doesn't make their opinion any less valuable. It's just different. So I, I, I would just take the phone number thing off. Okay. So is your motion to take everything off and put a put a box to check whether or not that information that they've got on there can be used? No, just to take this slot for your phone number off. So it's still going to be their award and their name and their address, which is important. I, I still think we can. Do we have a disclaimer somewhere in the building saying that this is being recorded? I think we have to have that, don't we? No, it's a no, we don't. Okay, It's a public meeting. You have no expectation of privacy in a public building. Okay. And then I'm happy to volunteer my city iPad to put over there and people can look up what word they're in. So the motion is to remove the phone number section from the card. That all that is on that card that we, we're going to make optional? That's up to you all. But That's there's fine. no other, there's no email or anything no. on that card. Okay. So yeah, name and address would be required and then phone number is optional. So you're making a motion. Let's get a second on it. Rob, okay. All right. Any other thoughts, any other discussion then on the motion? Just for the sake of clarity, we're making phone number optional with like an asterisk that says optional or removing it and providing any additional information as a separate. I, I, yeah, optional is fine. Okay. I, I think optional is best for the reason that if they're willing to get their phone number, then they might want to be recontacted. Yeah. So at least give them the option not required. Okay. Oh, it's been seconded. Can I make yeah, a question? Sure. Um, so, could, should we add a, a like a something at the bottom with an asterisk that says um, information will be public? Just something that shows that it will be it will be appear in the minutes, something like that, so they know and they don't come back and say, "Why did it get there?" I think that might be John. Is that like a little disclaimer in the bottom that says, you know, this information may be published as part of the record or something like that? Uh, we can certainly. Is it required? No, uh, I'm not concerned about it legally, but we can add something that says uh, all form, you know, something to the effect of all forms of all forms submitted to the city become public record, record subject to disclosure. Okay. So maybe make an amendment so that we put it on the, the motion that's there. I will. I will make that amendment. Okay, and then uh, seconded by Dave. What? All right, Dave. Yeah, it's, this sounds pretty petty, but if we just ordered ten thousand of the runs we have, uh, do we want to turn around and order more? So uh, maybe uh, with that card of the cards. Yeah, I think we just replace them when these cards are when these cards are gone. We replace with the next printing. Is that part of your motion then? Carla, do you know? Okay, just off the cop here. Okay. All right. So you don't have boxes of them stacked someplace. Or... Okay. All right. Good. All right. So it looks like we got the motion and the amendment. So all those in favor, uh, first we got to do the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Anyone oppose or abstain? All right. And now back to the main motion uh, that we have. So any other discussion on the main motion? All right, so all those in favor of the main motion now say aye. 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 Anyone oppose or abstain? All right, that addresses that item there. So now we're going to move to the review of liquor license amendments. Um, is that Rick or is that I'll, John? That's I, I will handle that. Uh, at the last meeting, um, there are some questions that are outstanding. I received several questions and I can provide the responses to you now. Uh, the first question was suggesting uh, measurement tolerance for the definitions of intoxicated or intoxicated condition. Uh, I, it is, I can speak, I'm too tall for this thing. Uh, I'm going to recommend, so the, the, the recommendation was a measurement tolerance for process and process for the definitions of intoxicated or intoxicated condition. Those are terms and the definition we have is consistent with the statutory definitions and they are understood terms in law that it is not a hard and fast rule of 
for the purposes of liquor licensing. It's not meant to be like driving while intoxicated where you have a, a blood alcohol content. It is observational and things of that nature. So having that flexibility is important in this law and I would keep it as is because it is also consistent with state law and has some case law understanding to it. Um, the next question was the definition of intoxicating liquor. There's references to percentages, and it was suggested that we clarify percentages by volume, and I agree with that, and those changes are being made. Uh, the next is we define light wines, yet medium and heavy bodied or not. Light wines is a term understood in the liquor license, liquor laws, medium and, and heavy or not, uh, and it's not flavor profiles <laughs> it's it's blood alcohol or it's alcohol content um and it's a it's a term that is defined in statute we're just being consistent with statute and state licensing regulations uh the next question was uh how much will each of the license charges change from our current ordinance uh the way they're drafted they're at the maximum amount allowed by state law none of them will be in excess of what is currently in the city code, some of them will actually be lower to be consistent with state law. Because uh, state law limits fees to one and a half times what the state charges. And that's what we have as our maximum. Or what we have as our fees is the one and a half times what the actual state law is. And then finally, there was a question of um, permits for special events that be submitted five days in advance of an event and whether they need to be uh, approved by committee or council and the answer the way it is drafted is no it's an administrative approval uh, primarily because in my experience uh, these things come up where having council approval is going to negate having these at all because of the timing of everything so those are the five questions i had but i'm happy to answer any others that you may have councilman farmer yeah just about the the last one with the special permits um do the owners have to like ask for that or is that something that the city can reach out to them about and not get in trouble for if that makes sense well so what these typically are there's they're caterers permits so if you're having an event at a location and you don't have your own liquor license you can a caterer can come and serve liquor at your location as long as they have a license generally uh, we've seen that happen with a beer garden uh, that wanted to operate uh, last year. And there, from what I understand, people are pretty usually pretty good about asking first, but if they do it and still need to get it, the city does a good job of trying to work with everyone to make sure they're getting the licenses they need to operate. Now, if someone just does it without bothering to ask, well, that's a different issue. And by the time we find out, it's usually too late and they've operated in violation of the ordinance. Uh, and then it's just a matter of what are the remedies we want to instill? Is it, hey, next time, follow the ordinance? Please ask. Yeah. So, because I think the issue, and I may be misremembering this, one of the restaurants in Town Center didn't have a liquor license for the day we had an event or something, if I remember right. So would they then need to get a catering permit or is that something else? The if they are serving at an event, they will need to, you have to have a liquor license to serve alcohol, no matter where you're doing. And you, yeah, I think they were doing it in their, in the restaurant, but they couldn't, I can't remember how this worked. I think it was milk and honey or ben, one of them, one of their liquor licenses doesn't apply to the day we had an event. Okay. Okay. And so they couldn't uh, serve alcohol in, not at the event in their restaurant right. in town center while the event was going and on. And part of the issue is that our ordinance as it exists now is grossly under-inclusive in terms of what the state allows in terms of special event permits, catering licenses, Sunday sales, tasting licenses. And we've included all of this into it to make sure that we are covered the same as the state. So then this, so this would away. be addressed, yes. Councilman Clark. Does this um, cover at all about the parks and um, just uh, we we voted on not having the liquor in the parks? That does not, this does not change that. This is a licensing regulation. The parks regulation already says you can't have alcoholic beverages in the parks.
you looking for any action then on this one here or it is a it is a for action item and can be a motion to recommend approval of this to the city council okay council member farmer that's a motion second by council member nyan any other discussion on the motion all right all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. anyone oppose or abstain all right the motion passes so now we'll move into public works under for information with the first item is the update on deer management. John, do you want to handle that one? I'm just kidding. I thought I'd have a little fun. Um, <laughs> during the headlines, yes. Um, council members, I don't have a lot to report, quite frankly, but I anticipate that we will have this on the agenda pretty much as a routine monthly item going forward, unless you object to that, to provide you an update on what we're planning, what we're working on, and maybe potentially bringing to you shortly. I would like to say a couple things, though. Um, working with City Administrator Cross, um, we did have discussions and are working with John Young to essentially hire uh, former Sergeant Brad Woodenling. I think you're aware that we had proposed that previously. So that is underway. Um, Hope to have him essentially signed up by the end of the month and um, would like to start working with Brad by April 1st um, on a part time basis. So I don't envision this being any more than 10, hopefully on an average, no more than 10 hours a month. Um, but I think that would be sufficient to draw upon his his um, his experience and his knowledge relative to hunting in, you know, obviously firearm usage and regulations. So. Um, I think that'll be very helpful. Um, so hopefully I'll bring him um, and he'll be participating in future meetings. I don't think he's on, is he on as an attendee? Um, so I, if he isn't here in person, I'll, I'll be sure that he is potentially present at some of the future meetings of, of this committee. So um, that is moving forward. Um, the second Thing I wanted to mention too is that Tom Lee and I had a discussion earlier this week, um, and I asked him if he'd be willing to help out because uh, one of the keys, key components to this, and I think you guys have stated it, we've recognized it, is going to be communications and with the public, with uh, property owners, um, whomever. So Tom has very graciously um, volunteered to help out. And I think that would be a huge help to me and to the effort to have his expertise um, working with us. So I would envision kind of the three of us working together um, uh, on a routine basis, try to pull this together, um, you know, to prepare the details of the plan that we're going to present to you um, moving forward. And the way I'm looking at it is we're going to try to bring some detailed proposals for essentially <clears throat> increasing hunting to reduce the deer population, right? So um, we've already reached out to White Buffalo. So we'll be, we will be re-engaging with them and presumably bringing forward a updated proposal for sharpshooting next winter time. Um, and I wouldn't foresee that work starting much before December because that's when they start baiting, but there would be uh, a little bit of work in advance of that, obviously identifying property owners, reaching out to property owners, getting those things ironed out. So um, the second component, obviously, I, I would like to present some ideas about increasing archery hunting, hunting in Wildwood. And that was the original plan, frankly, was we heard there was a lot of interest from bow hunters to hunt more. And certainly we can argue the merits of that, but I think there's plenty of deer to be reduced in wildwood. So there's probably a role there and I don't see any harm in that, frankly. Now, whether it's going to be as effective um, as we'd like it to be, maybe, maybe not, but I think there's a role. So am I envisioning bringing you some more ideas on how we can incorporate archery hunting into the equation as well, um, unless you're opposed to that idea. So, um, and archery season starts in September. So we're going to have to work towards that in mind. Um, and I think a large part of that equation would be reaching out again to Aaron Shank with conservation um, and finding out what's happening in that regard um, at the state level. So I, I think she she's just going to be a valuable resource as far as that effort. Um, so that's, I guess, where I'm coming from right now. Um, so if there's any questions, I'll be glad to address them. But uh, again, I think we'll have 
this on the agenda for next month and hopefully um, Brad will be on board and we can uh, start talking a little bit more in detail next month. Great. Uh, Council Member Jackson. Rick, thanks for the work on it so far. Looking forward to having um, the new guy on board. Um, one of the things that I would I would like to see as you're moving forward, right, is just set some marks in the in the road that help you know that you're. I, my bottom line is I want to make sure that we are ready to pull the trigger, pun intended, next year on certainly. Um, White Buffalo or whatever contractor we decide to go with, as well as the hunting option. I'm absolutely a fan of both options. Um, and then the one other thought I had is, um, please, as you all are working on it, look to develop metrics that we that you can use to measure success and 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 be able to bring to us to give us some level of. I don't know, reassurance, uh, both from your own opinion, as well as, you know, the hardcore facts of, hey, this, we think we're having an impact here, but this isn't achieving what we want it to, we need to, you know, adjust fire there, or whatever. I, I think Dr. Rambo's report gave us some, some decent numbers to start with, and then hopefully we can build off of it. But thank you very much. Anyone else have anything? All right, Rick. Well, then I guess that's an update for now on that one there, right? Oh, oh, did I see a hand? Council Member Clark, sorry. Yeah, I just had one question about the archery hunting. Are you um, talking about um, maybe bringing in an uh, archery um, group or just having archery hunters? And are we going to have, you know, if if they're going to do it, in an organized manner, like coming to the properties in Wildwood and hunting on other people's properties, um, will we will we test them some way? Will we know that they are um, good with the with their killing and not just going to have harmed deer running around? So, Council Member, I. I Obviously, I'm not ready to talk details at this point, but I think when we originally started working on this, I heard from a lot of bow hunters that were interested in, in hunting. And I think the thought was if we could just get those bow hunters that are out there or get get bow hunters, period, that are interested, lined up and um, pointed to property owners that are receptive to having folks hunt on their property, um, that's a simple way that we could promote it because you can legally hunt currently on in wildwood um if you're on another property you got to have permission you got to be able to prove you have permission but you can legally hunt and that was all we were intending was to um, encourage more lawful hunting um, within the city so right now you know if people are hunting and they are doing it legally and they've got a license to hunt through the state uh, we just wanted to encourage and expand that as much as we could um, essentially point hunters to property owners that are receptive and, and try to encourage it that way. Now, that could be a program that's more formal than that, um, but that was kind of the original idea. Um, now, we have heard some other thoughts thrown out um, more recently about, you know, can we pay people to hunt? Could we give them an incentive to hunt? Um, and I think those are ideas that need to be explored, but I, at this point, I'm not, I don't really have a, anything more firm than that, frankly. Thank you. That's what I was asking. Hey, Council Member Edens, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of nothing wrong with providing help pairing hunters and property owners, sort of the, the naturally harmony of, of hunting, if we don't take on additional liability. I just don't want to go backwards. We spent a lot of time on this committee um, establishing that we that we wanted a, a call program that included uh, firearms and, and not just bows. And so I I'm I'm fine with what we just discussed. I just don't want to see us go to, let's say, a bid for an organization that says they're nonprofit, charges no other city, but decided because we were paying for a different product, we would pay for them, even though it charges its members to hunt. So there's no accountability of where that money goes because those members aren't paid to hunt. So it's going in probably the pocket of one organizer. So I just don't want to go backwards on that discussion. 
but I'm fine with what you just suggested and with Sergeant Windling organizing that. All right. Looks like we had some good discussion on that. So Rick, we'll look for more updates and excited to hear about Brad Wendley. All right, moving on then, we have another for information item, uh, access restrictions on Turnberry Place Drive at Stricker Road. Um, thank you, Chair Garitano. This next item is on the agenda um, at the request of the City Council, frankly. So I don't have it under for action because I'm looking for direction at this point, but I wanted to provide you information um, relative to uh, the, I guess the discussion is the access at Turnberry Place Drive and Strecker Road. If you've had a chance to go by there, if you're familiar with it, um, Turnberry Place Drive connects between Clayton Road and Strecker Road. Um, that subdivision, and I don't know the exact dates, I believe was constructed in the early 90s. Um, and I think it originally when it was constructed, if you recall, Clayton Road was unimproved in that area. So it was a narrow two lane roadway. It wasn't very safe. Um, and I guess cut through traffic developed on that road, which wouldn't surprise me, frankly. Um, and so in response to it early on, the city council um, essentially acted and restricted through traffic from that road. So they wanted to prevent folks from cutting through between Clayton Road to Strucker Road. Obviously it is a public street and those can be controversial things to do, but that's what was done by the city council ultimately in 96, um, not too soon after incorporation. So uh, the way it was handled was a, if you've seen it, there's a, and I, I provided some photographs in my memo, but there's a fence across the northbound lanes at Strucker. And then on the southbound side, they tried to preserve the ability for emergency vehicle access. And they put in flexible delineator posts and the posts are currently, I took photographs of them in my memo. The, the posts that are out there right now are essentially, well, they're probably 42 inch high and they're more or less four feet high um, from the from the pavement with the, the base when you count for the base. Um, and they're flexible, they can be driven over. And if you look at them, they are visibly being driven over, um, unfortunately. And I think there's at least two that have been knocked out. So um, they are maintained currently by the HOA. And I'm don't I'm not privy to exactly how that transpired, but that's my understanding is the HOA has maintained those, I assume, since the inception. Um, so that's the current situation. I should point out, I think it did in the memo that about 2009, they apparently did have a request to install a gate. And at that point, it was presented to Board of Public Safety for review. And at that time, Board of Public Safety did not receive that request favorably. And I think they felt it was a public road and it should be open to the public. And because at that time, we weren't allowing, Mr. Berlin, you might chime in on this. I know we weren't allowing private straight, we weren't allowing gates on private roads. We do allow it now. Um, they weighed in on that and they didn't feel it was, it set a precedent if we if we put a gate on a, on a public street. So, um, Essentially, when that was the direction taken by the Board of Public Safety, the request was repealed, and uh, they did not go any for, far for, any further forward with that request for a gate. So um, I think at this point, I'll turn it over to you if there's any questions you have. Again, I, I think there was a desire to look at this or revisit this location and potentially improve upon the current condition. So. Um, I'll I'll end with that and certainly be able to ask ask any answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Um, I did see Council Member McCutcheon, and she's an ex officio member, so we can certainly uh, have her come on. And then Council Member Edens, I saw your hand go up second. So um, we've got Bertolino and Nyan. So uh, we'll start with Council Member McCutcheon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a pop up. Can't hear me now? No, we can't. Oh, it's not coming on the speaker here. Hold on a second. We're going to get the speaker in the room fixed, okay? Okay. All right. So, all right, Council Member McCutcheon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. I 
I looked into this um, when there was all the discussion on Birch Forest. So the, the request to put a gate up and the bollards up was based, was from the HOA. Um, and, but we have, we do have an ordinance that says you cannot put a gate or um, block access on a public street. You can, if there is a, um, an emergency access, then you can put some kind of barrier up for that, but you can't put up any kind of barrier for, sorry about that, um, for a public street. So my suggestion would be kind of use the same, uh, if anybody wants to do anything, use the same approach that um, you all decided to take with Birch Forest, which is, you know, put a camera up there and see what's going on. If people are driving over um, the ballards, you know, what, what then? I mean, are they, are they um, being utilized for why they were placed there? Um, and maybe take a, a survey of the residents and see if they are still interested in having them there. And I don't know if there's been a discussion with uh, the fire department lately, but um, that may be something to look into as well. Thank you for letting me comment. All right, great to have you here. Council Member Evans, you're up. Yeah, so my under, okay. My understanding based on what um, Mr. Brown just said is that the gate legally would be allowed, that, that, that that's not really the issue. I think what this document was very helpful with was sort of the um, public history of this. And since this has been going on really since 98, that was the first ask for a permanent gate um and on that's on page 56 of this document because i know it's a, a big one um so when i took this job i had some oral history passed down to me and then also had discussions with various trustees and every time i was told something different which again is why i appreciate this document so i had been told by you know one trustee that you know there that it was the fire department that said no to the gate when you can actually see from uh, the documents on file that that was clearly not the case. Um, and uh, another person told me it was the, the city that said no. Uh, but when I talked to the trustees recently, you know, they they acknowledge that it's an eyesore and there clearly is a problem. Um, otherwise, the bollards wouldn't be down. You can kind of see some scrapes and, and, and paint on them. They've been replaced over the years. So that's how we know that, that someone's driving on them. Um, we could put a camera up to see how many, but I can tell you just from word of mouth that it's the residents that live there that are doing it. Um, that's the general consensus. consensus. It's uh, a few people probably uh, that are, I would guess, repeat offenders. Um, so in that way, it's not an effective deterrence and it really doesn't look great. So I think what's happened, you know, is this, this issue was on the docket, so to speak, a long time ago. A solution was arrived at based on a board of public safety that had a different view. That view changed in the city. Other projects, newer subdivisions have continued to get maybe different and more attractive solutions. And then this one never sort of got readdressed. At least that's how I'm seeing it now after reading the document. And that makes a little bit more sense. So, you know, questions that that my HOA had was, you know, if we did, if we did ever have a gate, you know, what it, where would the electric come from for that? Would it be solar powered? Is it tapped in? I mean, that's a pretty wide spot to run it. I'm not sure if there's landscaping or other berms, and then we can kind of narrow the pathway in. And quite frankly, you know, we're using black and wrought iron and other materials a lot more now than we are plastic white vinyl picket fences. So now we have that on the other side. So and there, there has to be something I think that we can do that won't break the bank and won't leave it like this because um, I don't think there's ever gonna be a time where those bollards aren't broken and driven over and constantly replaced. Because I've been here for 20 years and it's been like that. That's a that's a long time for the same solution to not work. Um, um, I mean, Mr. Brown, maybe we can set up a meeting with the trustees. Is that kind of what, where you're hoping to go? Or do you have, I mean, do you have any ideas right now? Just this is a much wider path than what we just had, you know, behind Brightleaf. So I'm trying to picture how you would even narrow something in. 
Do you know what I mean? Well, it, it is a little bit wider in that the, and then I didn't measure, but it's, it is wider, I believe, than the width that we're dealing with at Birch Force, if that's what you mean. Yes. Um, so yeah. yeah, costs could be higher potentially. You have a little bit longer to span or to close off if you remove those, those posts and try to replace it with a gate or a gate and or some other measure. But um, uh, certainly I'm available if the desire is to meet with the trustees and kind of kick the tires a bit and, and get some sentiment from their perspective, that would be fine. I'm certainly able to do that. Well, and can I ask too, why, do you remember why they went with that particular fence and didn't do curbing and planting? I mean, I know it was cheap, but why, I mean, why, why is that? Cause we're, we're doing that in other places. We're... Well, the desire for the gate, and I, I guess I got to be careful because I wasn't directly involved in a lot of those discussions. Joe Vunich was, and we're talking again the gated birch forest. At the, oh, I mean, I mean the white fence on here. The white I'm fence. Sorry. The I'm white sorry. fence on Turnberry. Why? Why did they not? That I, I do not know. That was yeah, it's, it's, twenty-five it's very years ago. Odd. It <laughs> seems like it should. They could have curbed it in and done another median strip or or something because. All it did was make two lane traffic where people are driving over the on the bollards on what would have normally been opposing lanes because it was it's wide enough for that. So it just it just narrowed it and you still have people going both directions. Very odd. Say that again. Right. And when it was added, oh. But there is an aerial fence. I mean, you can see it. I know, but I get. I bet not because it's on page 122. It's pictured with the Wildwood logo. I think we helped put it in as part of the solution. It's all the way, in, it's at the very last page of the document. So I think when we did the bollards, we added the fence, right? Well, I, I have made mistakes. That that was my uh, understanding as well. But I, like I say, I've made mistakes before. Do you want to first start with having some discussions? First of all, maybe trying to address those people that are, you know, residents there that seem to be going over. Well, I mean, I I think the problem is, you know, it's more than just citing a couple i think that, again the majority i think are people that live there but there's also clearly the potential for somebody that doesn't live there to use that cut through traffic as well because it's just not acting like a deterrent and i think it's because of the width right it looks like a street you can see the end of the street people know that they're flexible it's not like there's three bollards and a narrow cut through it's a bit so um i yeah i think what i would like to do is is have a meeting with the with the trustees and director brown and then maybe talk through what they sort of see a, a solution as because this is this is a chief complaint of folks that live there and i do believe it affects property values and then come back to the committee with a you know a workable solution yeah i think that uh might be a good way to get started there um council member nine um since this did happen so long ago are we a hundred percent sure that people still are opposed to having that as a regular entry and exit. I know you said the trustees are, but do you know that obviously the people that are cutting over it are because they live way down on that end. Clayton Road has been improved. Like to me, this looks more complicated to cut through there than it does to just go on Strucker and go around the proper way. I I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking of other cut through areas and streets where we've put signs. This is not a cut through street, and then we with some, you know, speed deterrence. And then we post some police officers there until people get used to the fact that this is not a cut through street. And if you cut through, you're going to be penalized. If I lived on that back stretch, I would be like, I I'm tired of driving all the way around to get to my house. I mean, obviously that's their choice. I just feel like maybe we should start from the beginning again and ask if maybe that is an option. Not, not that I don't believe the trustees, but Sometimes the trustees don't represent everyone. And sometimes you hear the people that complain are like two or three people when the majority of the neighborhood may feel differently. 
I, I think it's worth it. I mean, I uh, I drive down that street every day, twice a day, and I've noticed a vehicle parked at the very end there that has caught my eye because it's like, wait a minute, if this is supposed to be for emergency access, well, then the parked vehicle is not going to let a fire truck go through. But I do think it's possible that it might be people who are closer to there that just don't want to do the drive and just kind of pull right in. Uh, and that's the spot, too, where people go in the morning because the kids all got on the bus. They get on at Strecker Road right there. So the neighborhood, they all, you know, I see the cars in the morning if I get stuck behind the bus over there. So it might be worth, you know, having that conversation, just trying to understand it. And if not, maybe then, you know, trying to narrow it down. If we've got the technology, you know, I guess like Councilmember McCutcheon said, maybe put the camera and try to see who it is. Maybe it's a repeat vendor. It always does it. More information will be helpful for us. Rick, do you have anything else you want to add? Or Well, I would say I, I, I'm agreeing with Councilmember Farmer that I don't see that fence on that plan. So I, we, could, we could try to find a little more out in terms of when that fence was built um, or when it was placed or how that came to be. Um, and we, if you'd like, we can certainly talk to Captain or investigate the possibility of putting a camera out just to see, or if you want to wait until we meet with the trustees, that's fine too. Either way is fine. Yep. Yeah, I would do, I mean, just like with the other one, I, I would put the camera up if it doesn't, you know, is if it's not prohibitively expensive, that's great. I also don't know, I don't know if either of you guys will know, it, what, if any process do we have to ask a subdivision that the individual homeowners a question, like a survey that homeowners of a subdivision, can we do something like that? Well, I think um, we can ask, certainly. Um, I We worked with HOAs before. It's usually been more in my experience with issues of adding stop signs, things like that, where we've tried to gauge their support to make a change in their subdivision. So we could certainly ask if the HOA is supportive and they want to take the lead in that. Um, I'm just wondering, like, I know for our subdivision, I don't know how many houses are in turn very offhand, but for me and as a trustee to do a survey is prohibitively expensive as an HOA. Like it's a lot of money. For, for me to do it. I don't know if it's the same for the city. We just send a postcard out to the homeowners and are like, if you have an opinion on this, check a box or whatever we want them to do. But I, I think we need to understand. I mean, I'm looking at those pictures. I think we need to get an understanding of how the HOA is in charge of any of that. If it's a public street, that just seems weird to me. And then uh, what did, when did you take those pictures, Rick? Was that recent? So like the, Ballards or whatever they are look bad, but also the road underneath it looks like tanks have driven across it, which seems odd if there aren't very many cars going by. So, I mean, I think there's things as a city we need to do from a public works perspective on a public street. But a bigger question is how has an HOA decided to close a public street? That just seems very strange. I mean, I get it back in the day, 30 years ago, Wild West, I understand, but it just seems weird. Well, and I appreciate that. We, we have, you know, had similar requests come to us more recently, and and normally they've, we've handled those with restrictions on through traffic, which have been supported in different manners or different <laughs> um, ways. But um, we haven't closed a road, at least in my experience, being at Wildwood, we haven't enacted restrictions on through traffic on on a few streets. Okay, that's my readings. Yeah, I just just as a courtesy, I will give you a heads up. Yeah, I, I don't have a good metric on how many people in the entire neighborhood would want to see it open versus not. My heads up to the department and to the committee is that um, I think it'll sort of be, um, how do I put this, over my dead body from the trustees uh, because most of them have been around um, for, well, some of them have lived there 25 years. So they remember how bad the traffic was before whether or not the road has in fact improved doesn't change their memory of how dangerous it was before it was added. And so I think that that's what they're going to say. Um, there, yeah, we could speed humps. The other thing I think, is it, um, director Brown, is it, there's a gate, I think over 
it's off of church road or there's a, there's, I've got another gate between, yeah, with, I've got another gate between two of my, um, other neighborhoods as well. So I know we're doing it in other areas that are publicly adopted streets. Um, so again, we've changed our policy and then we just kind of left this area behind. So I could try to get a picture of that in another area if that's helpful, but I just. Well, I can also provide more information. I know, I believe we have four other gates. I think there's four, four or five gates that we have installed as secondary means of access, essentially the back parts of subdivisions. I think there's two in Wild Horse subdivision. Um, at least two others out there. And I think they're generally fairly typical. I can provide more details if you'd like on those access points and how they've been constructed. But I think most of them are fairly basic gates that are locked with, you know, they utilize a, a old fashioned lock and key. But oh. if you'd like me to report that back, I can certainly do that. Yeah, that uh, would be interesting just for future situations too. Any other discussions? Uh, Councilman Bertolino. Yeah. <clears throat> Is the is the primary issue here that the HOA is concerned about the aesthetics of the ballast? Is that really what they're complaining about? And they're saying we want a gate instead of the ballast? Or is that really the is that their request? I'm kind of in a fog now as to who I, really wants what. I think I think it's their one, they don't want it open. Two, they feel it looks bad. Three, I think they're tired of replacing them. Well, I mean, I, they, I mean, yes and no, because they were also told no by the city for a gate and other means. So yeah. I don't know that they know that it's their choice at this point. But uh, well, yes, that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it was just an aesthetics thing. And I, I don't think we want to stick our nose in the HOA's business. Um, they do represent the, the citizens of that particular subdivision. And to force them to do a survey or whatever probably is overreached by us. Uh, although I'd like to say it, but I think it's overreach. Um, but if really what they're concerned about is aesthetics, uh, would they be satisfied with saying a gate's not possible? We're not going to do a gate, but there might be some other landscaping ways to achieve the same thing and aesthetically pleasing, but still accessible to our heavy equipment. Would they be open to that? I would think there's a very strong likelihood. Okay. Well, uh, I do think it just comes back to, you know, again, maybe getting that some data, right? Can we, I think the camera would be helpful to at least tell us what's going on, because if we're, if not, we're doing all this discussing or what may be the same car over and over. And maybe that one needs just a visit from someone to say, you cannot be doing this and you know, it's you. It all depends. Yes, except for it doesn't change that there is still an aesthetic problem at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. What would you also say? Not not opposed to fixing that decision. You don't get to take a hard line on one. You don't. You don't get to take a, a hard line on one direction and then not except what that means on the other side. You don't get to say, we're not going to open the street, but you have to pay to make the street look better. If it's a public street, great. As the public, we don't get to use it. So it's, I mean, I get it, but it just seems sort of oddly closed-minded. All right, Councilmember Clark, you have your hand up. So I, I have a question, and maybe I've just missed this, but, um, or it went over my head. The, the, um, the, Danger of this intersection is what? Why did they why did they want it closed off in the first place? And is there a, a safety reason or just didn't and if there's a safety reason, is there some other way to address that safety reason than to address that closing it off? Um council member, I I believe the primary principle was merely to address the issue of cut through traffic and all the negatives that comes with the, tra the, the or at least the perceived negatives that come with that volume of cut through traffic. You know, the statements where they were speeding and they were trucks and it's 
becomes a public safety concern from the perspective of the residents. So it's eliminating those cars from driving down the road. Well, I, you know, I understand that, but don't we have that in almost any neighborhood? I mean, in my neighborhood, they come in, but there's only one way out. So people come in, they don't know that they turn around and they go out and sometimes they're driving too fast. And, um, you know, sometimes we go out and say, Hey, you know, yeah. slow down, but it just seems like it's a public street and it's a public neighborhood a street through a pub uh the public street is through the neighborhood why would we do that for one um neighborhood when those issues are all over well that's a difficult question to really address because i you know i don't know the any of us were really around at that time quite frankly but do we have this problem other streets yes we do it varies obviously depending on where you're at. Um, but I would say, and I think I did see in some of the data that <clears throat> there was upwards of two thirds or, or excuse me, there was upwards of 60 plus percent of the traffic on the street was cut through traffic, which is a very high percentage. So um, I would say the degree of the amount of the cut through traffic was what was driving the issue. Certainly we have a lot of cut through traffic. That's a relative term on, on most streets to some degree or the other, unless you're on a dead end cul-de-sac, there's somebody's going to be cutting through on your street. But uh, the, the amount of the cut through is I think what was driving this, this issue. It was a very high percentage, um, much, much higher than you would typically expect to see on a residential street. Well, I don't know. I think we've kind of beat this one up quite a bit here. So let's see what we've got clear steps then as far as what we wanted to do. Um, and I'm gonna look to Council Member Edens, because I think you're owning this one here. So let's what's well, well let's uh start. I'll co I'll copy you as chair and I'll start an email with um Director Brown and the trustee contact information that I have and see if we can't set something up on Zoom and try to see, you know, what what else uh, we could do and see if they can, if anybody of them knows the oral history about that fence and how they ended up on a public road paying for the dividers, like what, what kind of swap deal was made back then for that? Just out of curiosity. All right. Sounds good then. Okay. All right. So um, we'll move forward then into the next item then under for action. So, Rick, this I'm going to assume is you, the proposed city consultant agreement for engineering design of the Route 100 left turn lane project. Thank you, Chair Garitano. John, I won't bother you on this one. You're welcome. Um, so, this is the um, Route 100 left turn lane project. Um, council members, as you may recall, um, previously we brought to you a recommendation. Um, for a consultant contract um, for the Route 100 J-turn projects. There are two sets of improvements that are proposed on Route 100. Um, the J-turns is the first project. The second is the left turn lanes. So we have um, the desire to move forward with the design of that the Route 100 left turn lane project at this point in time. Uh, you may recall, we also did get essentially state funding for half of our costs to design and construct the uh, four left turn lanes on Route 100 that would be constructed at Bunis, Manchester, Woodland, Mendo Woodland Meadows, Hankin Road, and uh, Windy Hollow slash Hawks Rest Road, those four locations. So to begin the design, we did um, solicit for consultant letters of interest um, earlier, or I guess it was really last year. Um, for the project, we are required to follow MoDOT's requirements in this case and state law as well as federal law that it has to be a qualifications based selection process. So we uh, received three letters of interest for the project, um, one from Horn Schiffer and one from Terra Engineering and one from Access Engineering or Trek Engineering. Um, Dan Ron and myself evaluated the uh, the letters of interest that were received and ultimately decided that Horn and Schiffer was the um, what we deemed to be the most qualified of, of the firms that submitted letters. So with that um, selection, we uh, 
worked with them to negotiate a scope and a fee to do that work and to design the project. And uh, that's what we're presenting to you tonight is a request um, to move forward with the selection of Horner and Schiffer and, and to enter into a city uh, consultant agreement with them to do the engineering work for the Route 100 project. Um, the amount of the request would not exceed $290,042. And I will note that does include an additional $10,000 for additional work that might uh, that might come up um, as approved by the department. So that is the recommendation to you um, tonight. I'll stop and uh, I'm, I'm available for any questions from the committee. Thank you. Hey, Councilman Burley. Yeah, uh, Rick, is, this is a joint project with the state. Um, are they going to have a portion of this that the state's going to pay for? Or are we going to pay for it all? Um, the cost share agreement is essentially a 50-50 cost share. So they pay half, we pay half. Um, that's that's the portion, uh, that's the plan as it currently is. Yeah. And, and that the number you just quoted, the 200,000 or whatever, is that our half or is that is that the full amount? Um, that's a good question. So, and I should be prepared to answer that one. So the engineering as well as the construction are eligible for reimbursement at 50%. So essentially they'd be paying half of the design half okay. of the construction cost for the for the improvement okay yep does the state have to approve this contract if this um, engineering contract essentially yes we will submit it to them um or their essential essentially for their rubber stamp um after we, we approve it at the city that's okay. correct yeah uh i'd like to move that we approve the uh, recommendation from the department okay second and then a second by council member clark all right, any other discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, anyone opposed or abstain? I think the motion passes. All right, next is the residential solid waste hauler request for proposal. Thank you, Chair Garitano. Um, this one I am going to lean a little bit on John Young relative to this next issue. John, do you want to weigh in on this and whether we want to discuss it in closed session? There's portions of it that we can discuss in closed session. If you want to do that now, we certainly can, or we can do it in conjunction with the other closed so, closed meeting items. Joe? I would say uh, we combine it with the other one, um, but is there anything at all that you want to cover in the open session right now regarding that? Other than... Um, mainly, I just wanted to present to you that the RFP that was prepared is being advertised currently okay. and uh, make sure that you're aware of that and, and allow time for you to provide any questions or answers. Cool. Okay. Council Member Berlin. Yeah, if I may, well, I, I see we have Ben and Linda on the in the waiting room there if we have questions. And I, I read through, Rick, the uh, um, what you had written on the uh, recycling and the waste proposal and I had my my question is if I read this correctly that that um in the future this contract is going to have to have a what's the term um a um automated collection provision which says that they will only pick up containers uh, my question I guess and maybe Ben or Linda can answer this is you know every spring or every every year people who who bag their 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 um uh, grass clippings might have four or five bags out there on the on the uh, curb uh, once a week. Are they saying that you can't do that in the future? That you have to put it all in a container? Rick, do you want to answer that, uh, or John? Well, I just want to say that because we do have an RFP pending, having pr prospective bidders shouldn't be participating in this Got discussion. It. So that would be a question for Mr. Brown. All right. Yeah. You want me to provide an answer? Okay. Yeah, and maybe Rick, if you can answer it, maybe to expand on that. I'm not sure. Um, uh, you know, yard waste, but certainly, I think one of the things that we have to also keep in mind is that you know during the holiday season, there's usually extra trash. Uh, you know, people get gifts, boxes, things like that. So, Rick, tell us what you know about that. I will tell you what I know, but I would also stress this is a request for proposal. So 
we have put together the document, but it is again a request. So it is subject to some changes as we get into this process, um, depending on the responses we receive. Um, right. However, I um, believe the way we have it laid out is that we would still collect yard waste as we currently do. So that comment with the automated collection doesn't apply so much for the yard waste. <clears throat> it applies primarily to recycling and trash. Um, both recycling and trash would have to be collected in an approved container. Um, I think generally the collection requirements for the yard waste would not change um, in that regard. They still have requirements relative to placement and how much on the curb, that kind of thing. All right, uh, Council Member Jaxie and then Clark. So Rick, one of the things I brought up, um, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't have time to read the contract or the RFP that we put out there yet. So if you don't know the answer to this one, I'll, I'll, I'll skim it again. I brought up uh, or was brought up was the rural nature of some of Wildwood and the fact that automated trash pickup may not work. And I didn't mention this then, but my lovely spouse reminded me that we have wildlife problems out there. So for instance, my cans, I have got to have some sort of a bungee cord on them, or we have trash all over the neighborhood, even if we put it out the morning of sometimes. So um, just curious as the RFP exists, do you address the rural nature of some of our neighborhoods? And I'll add on to it's not only rural, we have it also in town center. Uh, we have some narrow streets and alleys uh, where they have the small truck that does the same thing. So Rick, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, don't mean to make life difficult, but I mean, it's the realities of where we live. And if, if we've got to put it in the contract, then I'd rather we, we get it in there up front. No, the, the intent is to retain most of those conditions that are currently being met in, in regards to the smaller streets and the, the use of small trucks. Um, you know, that is in the RFP. We, we want to retain that requirement. We don't want to, I mean, that's a practical requirement. In most cases, we just can't use a full-size truck. We've, we have to use a smaller truck. So the intent is to retain those requirements as they currently exist. And I know we have, in some cases, very, we have valet service out there. We, we have some unique collections that we would like to retain on a case-by-case -case basis where possible. And, um, they may not be explicitly called out in the RFP. I would say that we are having a, on, on Thursday, uh, we will be having a pre-bid meeting. So the intent is to communicate that as well, that we want to retain most of those agreements that are in place currently, uh, unless there's a recommendation by the hauler to improve the situation by some means, but uh, we, we don't want to sacrifice our customer service. Um, and we want to retain those those very very those existing arrangements. Okay. Councilmember Clark. Now, along the same lines, um, the rural nature, and um, some of the driveways are very long and steep, and some of our people out, at least in Ward One, are older, and to get those larger containers um, down the the steep driveway or roadway and back up is difficult. If you hook it to the back of your car, it's still very steep. And at some places you could lose some things out of it. Um, and it's hard for them to even get it up to hook onto their car. So I would, I would ask that you talk to them about making exceptions for some of these areas. Some of us have to take it all the way from our home to the beginning of our neighborhood instead of just at the end of our driveway. And can you do that? Can you ask for that exceptions? In as far as the small trucks, that doesn't help in the neighborhoods where we have to take it all the way to the to the entrance because we don't even want the small trucks on our roadways. No, that, that again, that's the type of arrangement where we have those unique situations out there. What we expect is that that would continue as long as the residents desire it, um, unless the hauler has a, I guess, a better suggestion that's that's agreeable by the by the residents. So we're not looking to change those arrangements that are that are currently occurring in the field. 
well, I suppose that some of them are that they would not be using the automatic, it wouldn't be able to use the automatic. That That's something that will continue? That's correct. We would, we would continue the current situation uh, as best we could, yes. All right. Looks like there's no other discussion there, but maybe related to the topic, Rick, I know we had some angry emails over the weekend of missed collections in the town center. And I think also Point Clayton, I ran into a resident there that told me they got missed. Has that all been resolved or have you heard anything? I, I haven't heard any information to the contrary. We've been forwarding those concerns to uh, Waste Connections when they're received. And um, based on my experience, they've been addressed as, as, they've, as soon as they've been received. So I'm not aware of any that have not. But we did see a number of complaints come through last week for some reason, um, unfortunately. So do you know if there's any of those proactive emails, robocalls that are happening? Um, because those would be really helpful in those situations. And the problem with those folks, especially right here in the town center, is that Friday collection kind of leaves them with garbage cans all weekend. So a lot of them take it in. And then when the truck shows up a day late, you know, a couple of days later on Monday to make up the collection, what happens is half the homes already have taken in the trash and given up. So, um, you know, again, I think that's another opportunity for communication to be taking place. So we can certainly bring that up with waste connections if you like. All right. Well, then, uh, it's like right now we have one more item then on the agenda. Rick, you're not looking for, are you looking for anything under this for action? Not, not, no, sir, I'm not. Okay. So one more item the treatment of the ash trees, Rick. For John. Thank you, uh, Chair Garitano. This next issue has been an annual issue, I think, for going on three years now. So, um, as you may recall, we've been working on the S tree problem for some years, and um, we decided in 2020 to start treating, um, at the time it was expected to be about 400 ash trees. And so we had Davy Resource Group inventory and essentially select what they felt were the best ash tree specimens that we'd consider to retain um, rather than to remove. So we started treating ash trees in 2020. And I believe at that time we spent about $25,000 um, treating trees on a two-year basis. So the treatment lasts for a couple of years. So we treated, the idea was to treat about 200 trees in 2020 and then followed up with another 200 trees in 2021. Um, so we're now in the second treatment on the second batch of trees that we originally treated in 2021. So I'm back to you to ask, essentially, if you wanna keep treating trees um, in 2023. Um, we have reached out to Arbor Masters, which has provided the prior year's treatments, and they've held their price the same since 2020. So I have a quote from Arbor Masters to retreat the trees that were originally treated in 2021, and that would amount to, I believe, 110 trees. Um, if I put the numbers in there correctly, I got to look at the right information. 110 trees for the amount of $12,337.50. Um, we have lost some of these trees, so the number has diminished um, from 116 in 2021 down to about 110 in 2023. Um, so if the desire is to move forward with the treatment, I will prepare the necessary ordinance and then present it to the city council for approval. The other option would be, quite frankly, would be say enough is enough. Let's cut these trees down as we have with the other ash trees within the city of Wildwood. But I would say they are the nicer species of ash trees. In some cases, when you drive down the roads, um, they're very nice trees and um, they will be missed to a greater degree than some of the others that we've removed if we cut them down. So with that, I'll close and I'm about for any questions. 
All right, uh, Council Member Clark. Yeah, Mr. Brown, what um, what would you, I mean, I'd like to keep the trees if possible, but what is your um, assessment of how the the reinfestation of these um, these bugs into the trees that we're treating will they because we still have ash trees out in the uh, you know in the woods that have these um, these Chinese beetles eating them so will they come out and get back into those because I I what I read was that the ash trees are all going to die because they just keep reinfesting. But tell me, tell me I'm wrong, please. Well, the, the treatments from what we've seen are, are effective. And again, they don't last forever. They last for about two years. So um, as long as we continue the treatment process, I've not heard that there's a limited amount of treatments that we are, we can make. Um, so I'm, I'm under the impression we can keep making the treatments indefinitely. Um, but I can certainly double check on that. Um, the The main issue that we kind of ran into on the second year in 2021 is we waited a little bit too late and the infestation had already started to, to uh, occur at that point. So that's why we did lose some of those trees because we were just a little bit slow to get that second batch treated in 2021. Um, but other than that, I believe it's been pretty effective. I will say though, if the desire is to keep treating trees, I would like to have, uh, I would like to complete an inspection of all the trees um, because I'd like to be confident that they are in good shape and um, in good enough shape to retain them. So that would be part of the uh, the thought would be to have uh, uh, an inspection done. And quite frankly, at this point, I'd probably have Davy Resource Group do it um, just to be sure that the trees that we're retreating are ones that we still feel comfortable of retaining. Um, if there's any indication that they aren't healthy, then we would go ahead and remove that tree. But I'd like to do that as well. So I would I would like to make that point. So, Mayor Clark, I would make the motion to go ahead and um, and um, treat the trees as described after Mr. Brown does his inspection. Is there a second on the motion? Made by Council Member Jaxey. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none then, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Okay, so now that will lead us to where we will uh, go in a closed session. And so we'll need to get a motion to close session. Let me just make sure we go under which appropriate code we have for closed session. Which one is it, John? Mr. Chair, I'm going to suggest going to closed session pursuant to 610021 subsections 1, 3, 12, and 13. All right. So hearing that, Councilmember Farmer is making a motion. Is there a second to go into closed session regarding that? Made by Councilmember Nyan, and this will require a roll call vote. So, uh, Carla? Councilmember Bertolino? Yes. Councilmember Clark? Yes. Councilmember Edens? Yes. Councilmember Farmer? Yes. Chair Garitano? Councilmember Jaxi? Councilmember Nyhan? Yes. So we're going to go into closed session.
All right. Good to go. You got to mute or we're good. All right. Anything? Well, we have a couple items not ready for action, but anything else under miscellaneous? I know. I know. We're, we're leaving. But when I was driving here going westbound on 109, I saw it across the street. There is a MoDOT sign, you know, one of the large green highway signs that has a bottom cut shear. So it looks like it's peeling away. So if we get strong winds, I don't know if it'll hold up much longer, but just wanted to re report that. Okay. Teresa? Yeah, just, um, Rick, we talked about this earlier, but the, um, we have workers on Wild Horse Creek Road that are um, working even at nighttime. Last night when I left the council meeting, the um, the charter, I'm assuming charters um, contractors were there still working and had it down to one lane in one area. So if we're not supposed to work at night, might need to contact them. Rick, you'll look into that. All right, anything else? All right, and then um, one thing I have is you probably also might note that Carla's uh, going to be switching out on us here, and uh, we'll have, I think, is it Michelle? Michelle? Yeah, we don't know. We'll figure it out. But Carla, thank you. You've been a part of the Admin Public Works Committee, so. Yeah, it was great having you here. So we know you're just going to be upstairs, so not too far. All right. Well, um, with that motion to adjourn, made by Councilmember Jackson, seconded by Councilmember Farmer. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, meeting adjourned.